good evening, everyone. It's a proud privilege to welcome all of you to this evening's symposium. I think uh, since we are uh, lacking a little time, in the meantime, I talk, I can request Dr. Nakul Sina and Dr. Sanjay Thagi to please uh, come on the dais. It's been an interesting day, and uh, I, rec I thank you all for the overwhelming response on our training village. Uh, it was quite a while, and I think uh, a lot of comments came in the morning uh, when a lot of cardiologists visited and played with our devices, that it was quite a while that an Indian company hosted a technology symposia in one of the CSI and NIC, which was for a very long time dominated by uh, US multinationals or European companies. And uh, it's truly been a proud moment today for us to present three landmark devices. Uh, two out of them will be manufactured for the world out of India. So in addition to it, uh, currently uh, Translumina, which was just started in 2010 uh, with manufacturing, in the last six years, we have uh, created a complete basket of solutions starting from a a, a, a puncture needle to a drug eluting stent involving uh, all the devices, balloons, guiding catheters, diagnostic catheters. And it's a proud moment for me to uh, uh, share with you that we'll be launching the world's first uh, truly non-polymeric dual DES drug eluting stent which will be presented shortly. And we'll also be presenting uh, for the first time a transcatheter tricuspid wall therapy. So. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate the fact that uh, even without drinks, you all are sitting and waiting here. And I'll now pass it on to Dr. Nakul Sina. A very good evening. So I'll, may I make a humble request for all the people standing at the back to come over and occupy. There are so many waiting chairs, vacant chairs here. So it said that the day should always end with something new. So here we have three very exciting lectures on new technologies which are on the horizon. So, I mean, with the permission of my co-chair, Sanjay Tyagi, let me invite other chairpersons, Dr. Yashpal Sharma, Dr. Sridhar Kasturi, Dr. Vijay Trehan, Srinivas Kumar, Dr. Channa, Dr. Sunita Vishwanathan, Dr. Florem Susuli from Switzerland, and Dr. Mahesh. I believe all of them are here. Please, please join us here. And without wasting any further time, let me invite you to the first lecture, which will be from Dr. Adnan Kastrati from German Heart Center Munich. He is a very well-known figure. He has come many a times to India. I think the first time he came was when we held the NIC at Lucknow in 2005 at SGPGI. So he'll be speaking to us on the future of drug eluting stents from polymer to non-polymeric deaths. Dr. Kasrathi, please. Thank you, Dr. Sina. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When we uh, talk about uh, Stands, we have to give tribute to pioneers who put, who implanted, developed, and implanted the first stent in coronary arteries. Here you see Dr. Sigward, who was uh, very intensively involved in the realization of the stent project. And uh, he, with uh, Puel, they implanted the first stent implantation in the coronary arteries in 1986. And the stent was the wall stent. For many years, it was thought that the stents are equal. They don't have differences in performance. It took a long time until we started to understand the factors that impact on the outcomes after coronary stenting. 2000, uh, it was uh, this uh, article published, Isar Stereo, it was the first randomized trial looking at the effect, at the impact of the strut thickness on the outcomes of patients having received coronary stents. And you see here two kinds of stents. One, very thin, 50 micron, and the other one, multi duet, 140. Both of them had the same design, and the, the main difference was in the strut thickness. The strut thickness was associated with differences in outcomes. As you see here, restenosis was much lower for stents with thinner struts, and also revascularization rate 
after the placement of the stent was much lower for the multi-link stent, which had a very thin strap. It is clear that less metal stimulates also the dreams of uh, getting rid um, completely of the metal. And we have very good examples showing that uh, after the resorption of the polymer um, scaffolds, you see a very good lumen of the vessel. But on the other side, we have now the results of many randomized trials comparing the bioresorbable vascular scaffolds with uh, standard conventional drug eluting stents. And here is a pooling of seven trials with more than 5,000 patients. And you see the comparison here. You see that the odd ratio in favor or in disfavor of the bioresorbable vascular scaffold is increasing over the time, both for target lesion failure and for stent thrombosis. That's why, although, although the initial results were very good, people were disappointed by the long-term results achieved with these devices. Now, the second factor that might impact the outcomes after coronary stenting was also the surface of the stent. We started, we focused on the investigation of the role of the surface in patients receiving coronary stents. And the first thing we did was to look at the very polished surface achieved by gold plating. To our disappointment, we saw that uh, having stents, the same stent plated with gold, having a very polished surface, you get bad results clinical and angiographic. So in both cases, patients having received the gold stents had also shown a higher rate of revascularization, a higher rate of restenosis. We looked at our experience with a different kind of stents and uh, saw the risk of restenosis connected with the stent type. You see here, the best stent was multi-link stent and the worst stent in terms of performance was the gold-plated inflow stent. As I said before, multi-link stent was the thinnest strut stent, but on the other side, it had also another property. It was the least polished stent. This, conduct, uh, this uh, induced us to look at the value of the surface modification in the results after coronary stent implantation. We did a relatively small trial with 200 patients randomized after changing the surface, after creating a microstructured surface of the struts, and compared the same stent design, but on the other side, very well polished. There were no cases of stent thrombosis for this small series, and you see a very strong trend to have a lower restenosis rate with a microstructured surface of the stent. On the we know also from the uh, preclinical data that uh, microstructural stent surface is associated with better endothelialization and is associated also with less neointima. On the other side, with respect to drug eluting stent technology, the microstructural surface increases the drug reservoir capacity, enables reduction of the needed polymer quantity in uh, drug eluting stents enables also very good performance of polymer-free drug eluting stents, and it is adopted by several drug eluting stent manufacturers such as Translumina Therapeutics, Brown, and Biosensors. 2002, we uh, saw the publication of the first results of randomized uh, clinical trials with a poly permanent polymer uh, drug eluting stent. You know that the first trial was the Rubble trial. One year later uh, came the results also for the Taxus. For both Sirolimus eluting stent and Paclitaxel eluting stent, it was shown a very evident reduction in the rate of restenosis, both angiographically and clinically. We had also the opportunity in a very large series of patients, 1,300 patients, to look at the serial changes of the lumen 
after having received permanent, either permanent polymer taxo stand or permanent polymer cipher stand. And you see here the differences after six months, but at our surprise, we saw an increase in late lumen loss after six months to two years. That means uh, this shows an attrition of the efficacy of drug eluding stents over time. That's why one of the thoughts um, was that uh, polymer, the permanent polymer, was associated with this uh, luminal creep at this stents. The ESAR project that led to the development of Yukon Choice PC created a, a stent with unique features based on microstructure stent surface modification, which allowed for lower amount of biodegradable polymer. The stent was strong of rich preclinical investigation and also strong of long-term five years data against current standard permanent polymer drug eluding stent. We know other trials also have, that had looked at uh, biodegradable polymer-based drug eluding stents but the comparison was with first generation drug eluding stents. And this is true for the leader styles, for biometrics against cipher. It is true also the, for the sort out trials that compared the uh, biodegradable based drug eluding stents with first generation drug eluding stents. But there are no trials with long term follow up, five year follow up, that compare these devices with, uh, with standard conventional drug eluding stents based on permanent polymer that we are using now. This was the first preclinical work. You see here the microstructured uh, surface of the stent, which is uh, more polished after coating it with the drug and with the biodegradable polymer. We looked also at the um, kinetics of the illusion kinetic of serolimus with the stent, and you see that having a biodegradable polymer, it slows down the release kinetics of serolimus. We had also very good vessel wall concentration of the drug with it as compared with much less if biodegradable polymer was not used. We have also very good results in terms of endotelization of this stent. Also, the inflammation was low, comparable to the bare metal stent. The first proof of concept trial was the ESA test 3 trial, which compared three types of stent. The first one was serolimus eluting, but without polymer at all. And you see a late loss of 0.47. The second one was the cipher stent with a late loss of 0.23, and biodegradable polymer based serolimus eluting stent with a late loss of 0.17. The trial was uh, including uh, 605 patients. The results reflected the same pattern also when you look at the restenosis, angiographic restenosis, and clinical restenosis. After that, it came to the pivotal study of the Yukon Choice PC stent, ESAR test 4 trial, which uh, results were published 2008. It was a very large trial with 2,603 patients which compared this kind of stent, by biodegradable drug eluting stent, with the two standard stents, Cypher and Cyan stent. One year results were uh, remarkable in uh, showing that very good results for both platforms. We had the chance to look at the five years results and compared the biodegradable polymer-based Yukon Choice PC with the Cyan stent, and you see here up to five years, no difference at all between them. If you look at the stent thrombosis results, the best of the three stents up to five years was the Yukon Choice PC with a very low 1.2% of stent thrombosis rate at this, during this long period of time. But the best way might be to eliminate the uh, polymer at all and uh, we saw very good results at two years for the polymer-free drug with instance, although the results at six months were not that good, were comparable to Taxus, but not were inferior to, um, to Cypher. But you see the difference between a permanent polymer 
and the polymer-free drug loading stent, which shows a constant result after six months. The results remain stable. But the problem with the, permanent, with the polymer free drug reducing stents was the very fast release kinetics of the serolimus. And you saw also before in the ESA test 3 that the lumet loss was inferior to Cypher, was inferior to Yukon Choice PC. That induced us to find the way how to release, how to slow down the release kinetics of this uh, stent. And we uh, found Probocol which is the only, almost the only substance that has shown an effect on restenosis after PTCA. We choose because this efficacy against restenosis, but we choose Probocol also because it is highly lipophilic and able to slow down the release kinetics. The ESAR project that led to the development of Yukon ESAR PC stent was based on macrostructured stent surface modification is the only polymer-free and dual drug drug loading stent available, strong of rich preclinical investigation, and also strong of long-term five-year data against current standard permanent polymer-based drug loading stents. You know also the leaders free trial, which has shown very good results uh, up, up to uh, one year with a polymer-free drug loading stent. But the comparison here was done against bare metal stents. And it is known that the polymer free are better than bare metal stents. When looking at the release kinetics, you see that the dual drug eluting stent technology or the, Yukon, uh, the technology used in the Yukon Iser PC stent creates the same kinetics pattern as shown for the Cypher stent. We had also very good results for, uh, for this kind of stent in terms of enotarization, in terms of inflammation in uh, animal studies, in terms also of uh, fibrin accumulation in these uh, animals. The first proof of concept trial of this stent was the ESAR test 2, 1002 patients in whom we compared uh, this dual drug-reducing stents with Cypher and Endeavor. And you see the results in terms of restenosis. The dual drug-reducing stents, Probocol plus Sirolimus, polymer-free, had a restenosis rate much lower than with Endeavor drug-reducing stent. After that, it came the ESA test 5 trial, 3,002 patients comparing the new generation Endeavor stent, the Endeavor Resolute stent, with the Sirolimus probocolelutin dilutin stent and in 2002 patients. We looked at one year results, having also done uh, coronary angiography at six months, and you see that uh, there is no difference at one year between the Resolute and uh, this polymer free dual drug eluting stent. Restenosis was uh, completely similar between the two platforms, and at five years, we saw no difference in the maze rate between the, two, between the two stent platforms. We looked also at the stent thrombosis up to five years, and you see here also very good result. 1.3% of stent thrombosis rate, definite or probable, up to five years with this polymer-free uh, dual drug eluding stent. Just to give my prediction, Metallic drug eluting stents will be the devices of choice even in the years ahead with the preference of biodegradable polymer and non-polymeric drug eluting stent. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kastrati. Uh, may I request you to join us here on the dais so that we can have some discussion. Uh, can I also request Dr. Vijay Trihan, who I believe came in late. Please, Vijay, come over on the dais. Uh, well, you have uh, given such new thoughts on the new work being carried on. Uh, I believe Probicol was tried many years back also, and there was uh, an effect on the HDL which it lowered yeah. further. So you think that's going to make an impact this time? I don't think because the local uh, delivery is, uh, is a very, very, sl very low quantity without that. But you know that we are not very concerned now even with the HDL. So we are focused on LDL, not on HDL anymore. 
all the Nyasin theory went out of the window. Uh, Sanjay, any comments, suggestions? You told us something about the release kinetics of uh, with probocol uh, pro kinetics. How long is the, the drug uh, there in the stand and how long does it take to get diluted completely? It is, um, it's, it takes several weeks for doing that and uh, they disappear both of them, probocol and sirolimo. So they have the same release kinetics because they are mixed. So, and may, so maybe within, may uh, within six weeks you don't see any more. Uh, they the last probocol. up to six yeah. weeks. Yeah. Let's move on to the next uh, lecture, which will be delivered by Skype because Dr. Hans Figeler could not come over at the last moment from Germany. Uh, he is an emeritus professor at University of Jena in Germany, and he has a very exciting thing to show us, and that is tricuspid transcatheter tricuspid valve therapy. So, are we connecting on the Skype or? Right, Dr. Figler, you are, you are most welcome. I'm not sure whether you can yes, hear us. Uh, yeah, I can, I can definitely hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud yeah. and clear. Uh, yeah, I'm very much uh, privileged uh, uh, due to the invitation I got and uh, I, I was really eager to come because I visited Hyderabad when I was a medical student 46 years ago so it probably has changed tremendously and uh, but due to um, to the fact that I didn't know that as a European citizen I needed a visa, so the airline rejected me at the counter and said they, 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 they couldn't transport me. So I really uh, apologize and I try to give the presentation now by, uh, by Skype. Uh, so I switch now to my presentation. I open the uh, screen and um, so the um, it's so you see the screen now. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah. We can we can very clearly see the slides. Please carry on. Okay. So okay, this is a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement, uh, which is which we call trick valve, and we think it's a breakthrough in the treatment of tricuspid uh, disease. Uh, I have to dis my disclosures are uh, uh, what is important in this uh, aspect is I'm a consultant of Transluminar and uh, PNF, uh, which is India. Uh, uh, located Translumina, and they will uh, will manufacture the well. Uh, so this is important also for India. So uh, my uh, talk is uh, separated in three topics. It's the first one is severe tricuspid regurgitation about the clinical background, the KV concepts, preclinical data on first in men, and the current clinical experience. In the morning, I. I talked a little bit about uh, other possibilities, and this is the patient group we are addressing. So these are uh, patients in, in severe right heart failure. You see the distended uh, uvular veins and uvular pus, pulse, huge load of water in the uh, lower extremities. And do we need an international interventional approach? Um, the mortality by uh, surgery is in, a, in the range of 10 percent, so it's due, uh, so it's three to four times higher than for sub. Uh, and when we do the medical treatment, you see that one third dies within a year, and in these patients, you probably have seen those patients, and they do very bad 
on, on the long, long run, so the mortality rate is really high. So, to point out, we need an uh, interventional approach, and there's a huge medical need from our perspective. So, um, tricuspid regurgitation is functional in almost all patients. It has a high prevalence, uh, 1.6 million patients in uh, US, poor prognosis and surgical repair has a high mortality as already mentioned. So the problem is that the, uh, that the annulus of tricuspid is huge. Here you see a scale which is, which is four to five centimeters. It's a free wall dilatation from the, to the lateral side and this is very f flexible and uh, uh, tissue, there is no real annulus, so to deploy a wealth within the annulus is very, very difficult. In the morning I talked about uh, autotopic concepts, um, and today I will focus on the heterotopic concept, which is uh, carval wealth implantation. So, uh, we, we started preclinically with animal experiments and we had to create an animal model, which was a sheep model where we damaged the tricuspid well. You see the huge uh, V wave in the right atrium in this animal prior to uh, uh, carval wealth implantation. And then we implanted the wealth uh, in the superior and inferior vena cava in the sheep model and as you can see the V wave is uh, very much, it's almost abolished and in no case we saw any thrombotic events in these animals. So this is the cardiac output when we created the uh, tricuspid regurgitation and when we implanted one valve, two valves and stressed the, uh, the uh, we could restore the cardiac output just by the fixing of the, in the heterotopic position, uh, the tricuspid valve. So we thought in the, as the valves didn't thrombize, what we feared that it might be also helpful to use it in human uh, uh, bodies. So we, we published all that in a bunch of publications. Uh, this was in, in 2010 uh, time period, and at that time uh, the tricuspid wealth was addressed as, uh, as a forgotten well. And in 2016, um, I show you, there was now interest generated and they, in the uh, cardiovascular disease archives, they claim it no longer the forgotten well. And we very much underline that. So, I want to show you the first in man case, which we did in 2010, uh, which is uh, deployment of self-expanding wealth in the uh, inferior vena cava, uh, in the superior vena cava. Um, here, is, this is a wealth self-expanding. It's huge, it's up to 43 millimeters, and it was introduced by the venous side from the groin with a 27 flexible catheter for transvenous implantation. Here you see the, these, these cases in, in 2010. It's a very simple procedure. As you can see here, you just, uh, here you see the huge uh, uh, V wave in the inferior vena cava. You see the regurgitant flow, centripetal uh, into the hepatic, hepatic veins. Uh, and what is very frequent Many of those patients, as this might uh, cover also your experience, have several leads in it, uh, the pacemaker, defibrillators, and so on. So this is a wealth. It's uh, very simple at that time, self-expanding wealth, uh, being fixed on the catheter with a, a sheath, which when could be retrieved then. Uh, so there is no, not much about from the technical point at that time. Uh, so even crossing with a 27 millimeter uh, device the, on the venous side is no, uh, is no deal, as you know, with the mitral clip system, and then the uh, stent is deployed in the vena cava superior, 
the leads are compressed to the to the side. Uh, this is one of the advantages of, of this uh, heterotopic implantation because, as mentioned, many of those patients uh, uh, suffer of, of, of those leads. So this is the inferior vena uh, cover device. You, you see it's, uh, it has a shirt in the upper part uh, and this is deployed like a chimney in the right atrium and the, the angelus of, uh, and the wealth is fixed in the hiatus diaphragmatic um, because there is a rigid structure. Uh, you see, it's in the, it extends in the right atrium and then there is a diaphragma hiatus and this is rather rigid and then the, the, the inferior wealth is also extended. Now you see trip instantly the V valve in the inferior vera cover is abolished and the, in the right atrium it's increased and you see there's no regurgitin flow anymore in the inferior vena cover and slight in the superior vena cover so the forward stroke volume increases. Here you see the uh, inferior vena cover valve, it looks like a cardiac valve almost, uh, it works uh, once there is this regurgitin flow abolished, you see it's uh, tight, there is no, there's very small uh, le leakage uh, w within the well. So this uh, first patient, she did very well. Uh, she's where she had an excellent device function. We now see her since many years. She improved tremendously from York 4 to 2. Uh, she had a normalization of liver function um, and uh, so because she, she began to have a synthesis deficit, deficiency due to this. And this is the V-wave uh, in the superior vena cover, it's, uh, it's slightly lower, but it's abolished in the inferior vena cover. However, of course, by this mechanism, the V-wave in the atrium increases and the mean uh, pressures decrease. So this is a patient, uh, she died with a stroke uh, and a hemorrhage some weeks after the implantation. You see the wells that don't show any uh, thrombos, they are in the correct device position and uh, that's how it looks like, no obstruction of hepatic veins uh, and no parallel leaflet. So the stent is fully covered. So now we changed the device due to the uh, huge variability in the anatomy of those patients. You see here the, the superior vena cover, uh, huge uh, and ex uh, extended here, inferior vena cover is huge, superior is 40 millimeters here. And so to address the variability in the uh, uh, vena cover superior and inferior, we changed the configuration of the stent. This is a superior vena cover and inferior vena cover stent, which is now being produced in India. You see, we have different sizes, and uh, so this adapts more to the anat anatomy. So now here is a, a small movie of the implantation now, which is uh, really uh, very simple. You, you see here is a bell belly, and. Uh, and then inferior vena cover, you see again the uh, flow into the hepatic veins and, and now very simple to deploy this valve again. And here you see the regurgitin flow is reduced uh, or abolished in the cover system. And here you see the echo of the superior vena cover system. Uh, it's fantastic how these wells also are they located in the veins. And here you see like a chimney in the right atrium, the inferior vena car. So again, the V-wave is abolished. And so what is the experience now? We overlook uh, several patients uh, being treated in, in many institutions. And this was written by my co-worker, Alexander Lauten. Uh, in this uh, year, 2016, uh, 2018, and uh, many institutions try to use uh, uh, 
inferior vena cava's single valve implantation, and uh, uh, but we in the majority uh, aim to resolve 100% uh, of the cava backflow. Uh, once you just implant one valve, you you just have part, partial treatment of the backflow. Uh, so of course this includes uh, two valves. Those are more expensive and. Uh, this is being used by inferior vena cava uh, coverage sometimes uh, they use a balloon expandable tava valve uh, edward sapien uh, this is widely available however the uh, uh, the cons are it has a max a maximal possible lumen of 29 to 30 millimeters so you need, need a preparation of the landing zone with pre-standing um, with some uh, stand and then uh, you can deploy it, otherwise it will embolize what it, this act, what it did actually. So, of course, this is developed for high pressure circulation, so the opening forces are pretty high for these valves, so they are not ideal. So we think this valve, which we constructed and uh, is more appropriate, it's self-expanding, we don't need an, an extra stent, uh, of course. Uh, it's uh, limited availability right now because there's no CU mark yes, yet and it's being made for comp compassionate use only. So these are the uh, patient population which we summarized from the different uh, um, uh, sites. So you see uh, most of them, three quarters were in Eurocard 4 and the left ventricular function was fine and uh, there was device embolization only with the uh, Edwards device um, in two patients out of 25. So this is really not ideal because it's just too small. And uh, but of course no pacemaker need, need and no stroke and so so. So what you can see this is the uh, inferior vena cava hemodynamics pre and post. So there's a drop in the pressures, of course, right hemodynamic stays a, a, a remain, and there is an increase in uh, cardiac output uh, in the range, and the clinical um, um, complaints are much improved. You see here three and four New York heart, and, uh, and just very little patients remain in three. So there's a huge beneficial impact by this heterotopic wealth implantation. There are ongoing trials with many of those uh, uh, valvular uh, re uh, and annular reductive devices. There's in the US is the HOVA trial going on, which is a CAVI with the Edwards wealth uh, being, uh, being performed. And we have the TRIC wealth uh, in Europe. Uh, and so we'll see in the long run what turns out. We conclude there is a large unmet clinical need and uh, due to the high surgical risk of these patients, it's not long. Heterotopic and autotopic procedures are in the early stage, as you saw. Uh, CAVI is very simple from the interventional side. It's much simpler than, let's say, um, uh, Valtech bending and things like that. It's straightforward. Uh, but you need to sh sh use a self-expendable wealth. It has shown clinical benefit and functional improvement and in these compassionate cases and the clinical trials are on an early stage. So I thank you for your attendance and apologize again that I am not personally present due to this uh, uh, visa, uh, visa problem which I actually generated. Thank you very much. I'm happy to get some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Fegula, for such an exciting Thank lecture. And it's a completely new concept, but I'm sure we are going to see a lot more. Any comments from the panelists? See, Dr. Figlu, I think it, this therapy would be effective in patients who do not have severe pulmonary artery hypertension. In our country, Tricuspid regurgitation is uh, most commonly due to severe uh, pulmonary artery hypertension caused by valvular heart disease. What is your comment on that? 
I think we have uh, well, lost contact. Of course, contact. there are limitations. I mean, uh, can, can you show the picture of, uh, so I can sh I'm sorry. I would like to see, uh, so we, we stop the presentation. Okay. Um, of course, there are limitations. I mean, the limitation is what once the, the right ventricle doesn't work anymore. So it, uh, because there's a huge uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, then uh, then it doesn't make sense. So the, in the clinical trial, it's limited to systolic pressures uh, above 80 millimeter mercury. We don't use these patients. And what we always ask for is that, that there is that there is a, a contracting right ventricle with a, a V wave. Once uh, there is no contraction in the right ventricle, I mean, then wealth replacement doesn't make any doesn't make any sense anymore. But this holds for all well regulated wealth diseases. Once the left ventricle is gone and doesn't contract anymore, then wealth replacement doesn't make any sense. So we need that here in these cases. Any other questions? So here the RV is, uh, I mean, the, the, the basic problem is still unaddressed. The tricuspid regurgitation will continue to happen, and the RA would continue to dilate. So what would happen to the RA? That's my question. Uh, I didn't really understand the question, what will happen to the right atrium? Yeah, the question is that uh, since the problem with the tricuspid valve is still there, okay, you have made SVC and IVC competent, but the RV will continue to decompress into the RA, which will continue to dilate, and also you have a coronary sinus which is draining blood from heart. This coronary sinus, we know that we can even ligate this that will be only, only a passive rise in the pressures. But if the RV is now not allowed to decompress in SVC as well as IVC because you put a valves there and everything is be, being decompressed into right atrium, so right atrium will continue to dilate and everything will now be pushed into the coronary sinus. What do you think will happen to the right atrium and coronary venous flow? Uh, so, I guess, as you, as I told you, and as we see now in, a, in many patients, uh, so the, the concept actually is once you reduce the regurgitant flow in the, um, for the right ventricle, uh, that the right, right ventricle will improve. So overall, because the volume load is diminished. So in, in the long run, and I could show you, even the right ventricular uh, the, the right atrium pressures will, the mean pressures will, will drop because the right ventricle restores. I mean, this is the case in all wealth regurgitant wealth treatment. I mean, you 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 improve the volume loaded ventricle, and that happens here as well. For the coronary circulation, it it has no impact actually because the the pressure, as you know, there is. Uh, the, the, we, we don't see any, any kind of ischemia in these patients. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Figula, uh, for your time and patience and uh, a very nice lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Thanks, Ajay Keithani. Th thank you, thank you, and uh, go, good, e good evening at your time. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Ajay Kirtane for telling us about the U.S. experience of Impella. Please. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you so much for having me. It's. Uh, Real honor to follow Professors Castradi and Figula. And I know I'm the only thing keeping you between uh, dinner. So what I'll try to do is make this a little bit exciting with some cases to whet your appetite a little bit. And I'll talk about various pumps matched with patient profiles to see how better we can treat our high-risk patients um, that are undergoing both PCI and also those with shock. 
It's really interesting because there's been a great interest in hemodynamic support that's existed over the past five to 10 years. But if one looks back into the 1990s, and this was a review article by uh, Mike Linkoff, you can see that many of the devices that we have now and are very excited about now existed back then in actual clinical form or even in investigational form. And so I won't read through the slide, but all of these devices that he's proposed are either used now or at least in one case still experimental. And the rest have um, progressed and iterated over time, but have certainly been used to help our patients. Currently, when we look at support devices for patients, there's a wide range of them. There are flow devices, there's pulsatility devices like the balloon pump, there um, are devices for the right ventricle, and there are devices for both ventricles together. And I think if you want to be facile at treating these types of patients, it's not about one device, it's about using them all together to be able to help your patients in the best way. And in order to illustrate that, I'll show you a case that we recently took care of at Columbia, where a 46-year-old gentleman was admitted to an outside hospital with what was thought to be DKA. And at the time he presented, his blood pressure was 100 over 60, his heart rate was 110, um, sort of threatening pre-shock in a sense, and he had elevated JVP with crackles on exam. He had a very elevated white count, his creatinine was, was in the normal range, but slightly higher than you'd expect for a 46-year-old. He had some metabolic acidosis and some, uh, some infiltrates. And this is kind of how shock often starts. The patients come in and they have all these subtle signs that they could be going into shock, but they're not quite there yet. And one of the things that we and others are aiming to do is to try to prevent the downslide of these patients and to prevent them from getting all the somewhat complications, elevated creatinine, acidosis, pulmonary edema that can happen if the shock remains untreated. In this particular case, he had progressive respiratory distress. An EKG that was repeated showed anterior ST elevations with troponins on the rise, and so he was brought to the cardiac catheterization laboratory at the outside hospital. So here is his films. I think you can appreciate there's significant disease in the circumflex as well as the LAD. Here is another picture of the LAD. 90% disease in both of these vessels. And additionally, um, here's a final view of this. Left main is okay. There's slow flow in the LAD. This is the ventriculogram that's done in a way that's somewhat dangerous for those of you that saw my morning presentation on the other side. And then the right coronary also has significant disease. So multivessel disease in the setting of DKA, worsening pulmonary edema, and the question is what the ventricular function is. And so this patient was managed with a balloon pump, which is, I think, I dare say, the way that many people here um, in India would manage this patient. And certainly in the United States, that becomes the dominant way of managing patients who are in shock. And the issue with balloon pumps are not that that's a bad thing to do. There are patients who turn around that way, but what happens if the patient doesn't? And so in this particular case, despite the balloon pump and despite escalating pressors, the patient progressed and, and an ejection fraction was ascertained to be 20 to 25 percent with anterolateral wall motion. He remained in the outside hospital for about four days on this therapy, pressors going up, coming down, going up, coming down, um, and then ultimately they called us to be able to transfer the patient over. So, why does this happen? Well, the reason is, is that balloon pumps can be very effective. They're well known, they increase coronary perfusion, they mildly increase cardiac output, but the problem with them is that they only mildly increase cardiac output. They do require generally a rhythm in order to work well, and they only unload modestly in this particular situation. So for some patients, they can be beneficial, but for patients that in, are in more progressive stages of shock, they can actually not help all that much. Now, there are some data favoring the balloon pump, and this is sort of the baseline data favoring support. Why do we use support versus no support? And the reason I show this slide is because the balloon pump has been very maligned in light of the IABP shock 2 trial. But in certain populations, high-risk PCI for which you're not going to do an extensive revascularization, this is the BSIS-1 trial, you could actually reduce paraprocedural complications. The primary endpoint of this study was negative, but the endpoints that matter to many interventionalists are things like prolonged hypotension, VTVF, and CPR, and those things were abrogated by the use of the balloon pump. Similarly, if you have chronic heart failure, not acute shock, but chronic heart failure, and you're teetering on the edge, this is data from our center at Columbia and our heart, heart failure transplant service by one of our fellows showing that across the board balloon pumps will increase the level of support by approximately 0.5 to 1 liter per minute as a whole. 
There are a group of patients that respond even more than that, but sometimes you can prevent these patients from further compromise by putting in the balloon pump. So in this particular case, it was not unreasonable, particularly given constrained financial resources, to start with a balloon pump, but the real question is, should you wait four days before further escalation of care? The reason that's important is because, as we all know, the IBP shock 2 trial did demonstrate no difference in mortality with balloon pump versus standard of care. Why is that? It did provide some support, didn't it? Well, the reason is, is because it only provides a little bit of support, and particularly in the patients that were randomized in this particular trial that had post-arrest, that were very, very sick, and the balloon pump was placed after the revascularization, it probably wasn't enough support uh, in the trial. The other aspect that happens often with balloon pumps is what I like to call IABP inertia. So patients go up to the ICU, they're intubated, they have pressors on, they have the balloon pump, and then the doctor and the patient rest. The problem with that is that as they rest, the creatinine starts going up, acidosis gets worse, the lactate goes up, and then the patient becomes non-salvageable at that point. And so what I would say is that especially in a cost-constrained environment, don't do nothing, use the support like a balloon pump, but the key is, is to realize that your mortality in that patient population is related to how much power output there is. In other words, what the arterial pressure is, what the cardiac output are, determines survival. The lower they are, the worse survival, and that was shown in the seminal shock trial um, in this uh, publication by Fink et al. The other aspect of this is that these patients are dynamic. Just as I described initially, the heart rate was a little tachycardic, but the blood pressure was controlled. Over time, you need to monitor these patients closely. And so we actively use swan gams catheterizations in these types of patients because as the patient turns around, then you can wean. If the patient stays the same or progresses, then you need to escalate. And that's what we call a dynamic caregiver who checks and checks again. They don't just send the patient to the unit and then go home for the weekend and not know what's going on with the patient. I suspect many of you have patients like this at home, um, and you're thinking about these patients. You're not just sort of saying, forget it, I'll come back and see what happens on Monday. So in this particular case, the pressures were slowly weaned when he transferred over, but when we looked at him, he had severe LV dysfunction, and we were aiming for a strategy of complete revascularization because the surgeons did not want to revascularize this patient. We felt that the best and safest way to do this would be with impella support, and I'll show you why that is and what some data is for that in a second. Now, why would you use support for a case like this? The patient is stable, and frequently our fellows often say to us, look, if I just open some of these arteries, then the patient's gonna get better. And the truth of these patients is they always get worse before they get better. And the reason for that is because, number one, when we inflate balloons in the coronary arteries, we make patients more ischemic. Number two, when we inject contrast, contrast does not contain hemoglobin, so patients become more ischemic. And additionally, other things can happen during the procedure, making them worse before they have time to recover. It also is not an instantaneous recovery. It takes some time for the ventricular function to improve. So that's one of the reasons why you'd want to use uh, prophylactic support. The second reason is, is that the more you use support, the more you can do. You could argue this patient might be stable with no support to do one vessel, but I guarantee you the more you do, if you're aiming for complete revascularization, if you do this without support, the patients get worse before they get better. I had a very interesting conversation at lunch today where somebody told me, look, you know, we know and we hear you talking about CHIP and complete revascularization, but the reality is that sometimes you should do less because the patient will get sick otherwise. I said, absolutely, that's the case. You can't knock the patient off while you're doing the intervention. And one of the ways to prevent that from happening is to use hemodynamic support. Then finally, the other thing that can be done is you want to do it in a safe way. You don't want to put a 14 French sheath in without knowing how to manage that sheath and manage the complications that can ensue. And so you really need to address things like optimization of volume status, transfusions as needed, or transfusing them before the procedure happens so as to avoid further problems. Now, not every patient needs support. There are three different patients here with the exact same coronary anatomy who have potentially three different solutions to how to treat them. So these are all patients with, in this case, two vessel diseases I've shown, but the first patient has a blood pressure of 130, the right atrial pressure is eight, the mean wedge is 14, and the PA sat is 61. Does that patient need support for a two vessel intervention? 
No. As long as you're good and comfortable and technically sound, that patient will do fine. On the other hand, if you look at the patient in the middle and especially the patient on the right, exact same anatomy, exact same coronary angiogram with a blood pressure of 96 over 78, a wedge of 33, and a PA sat of 38, you could argue that even with support, you shouldn't do that case. What you should do is first stop, diurese the patient, and then bring the patient back to do the intervention. So an important point of this is that we have to not just be technicians, we have to be clinicians. We need to fully assess the patient ourselves and treat them as doctors, not just somebody who pushes catheters in the cardiac cath lab. Now, what type of support did we use in this type of situation? This is the Impella device. Many of you are familiar with it. As you know, it recently got reapproved um, for use here in India. Basically, the way it works is it ejects blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. And in doing so, it decompresses the left ventricle, reducing volumes and pressures, and increases aortic pressure and flow. So it basically acts to reduce oxygen demand, increase oxygen supply, and also increase cardiac output, which is mean arterial pressure times, uh, uh, times the output as a whole. Now, is it more effective than a balloon pump? The PROTECT2 randomized trial, although the primary endpoint was negative, as you know, if you look at the thing it's supposed to do, which is to provide hemodynamic support, it does, and it does it more effectively than a balloon pump. Now, one of the important findings of this slide that people tend to forget is if you look at the level of support in this slide, the bars go down, they don't go up. The reason is, is when you do a high-risk PCI on a sick patient, as I stated before, they get worse. And so in this slide, in the red, they get more worse if they're only supported with a balloon pump, and they get less worse if they're treated with something more supportive, in this case, the Impella 2.5. The idea here is to be able to allow them to tolerate the procedure that you're going to do so that you can eventually recover their heart. Now, some people also ask, well, do I really need the Impella? What if I just do it with a balloon pump? Okay, I agree the patient's gonna get worse. Let me just use the balloon pump. Well, you can, and it depends on how much revascularization you're gonna do. On the left of the slide, in the same trial, if there's a limited revascularization done, based upon Jeopardy scores, you basically don't do differently with one versus the other. Personally, the, if, because we have availability for both, we tend to use the more supportive device in case something were to happen. But what you really need to know is that if you're gonna do an extensive revascularization, as shown on the right of the slide, the device that provides more support is the one that's gonna support you through the procedure and it's gonna be associated with the uh, smallest rate of outcomes. This makes clinical sense. If you're gonna do more, you need more support. So there are some studies that reflect negatively on this device. One that people do mention is this IMPRESS trial that came out not too long ago, only 48 patients. And I would put this in a category of really not informative. And the reason I say that is because in this patient population, virtually everybody had a cardiac arrest before the randomization, and many of them had other issues that allowed there to be very little signal to noise. There's so much noise with a population like this that it's hard to sort out whether this device is effective compared to the balloon pump comparator. Many of you do know there's a trial called Danshock, which is now called Danjur because it's been expanded to Germany, looking specifically at the use of Impella versus conventional therapy for patients with cardiogenic shock. So this trial is getting done. It's enrolling slowly, but hopefully this will give us some answers. Unfortunately, though, it does not give answers for people that you would, are so sick that you would want to use support anyway. This will only give answers for patients in whom there's equipoise for randomization. So what did we do in this particular scenario? We uh, we have bilateral access. We upsize the balloon pump sheath to a, um, to a regular device. You can actually upsize it and put the impella on the same side. And then with the impella in, did PCI of the LED, did PCI of the circumflex as well. Left is pre, right is post, and then P did PCI of the right. Why did we do complete revascularization? Because we felt that that gave the patient the best chance of heart recovery, and we wanted to aim to do it completely. If you were only gonna do partial or piecemeal, you could do it and it would be a little bit more dicey, but you can see even the case this morning, hopefully many of you saw Antonio Colombo's case, complex case, low EF, rotablation, the patient tolerates this remarkably well. 
Now, as far as how I would have managed this patient currently, we do see a, a shift in paradigm for use of these devices. It used to be we would only use these support devices after the patient decompensated. Now, there's been a somewhat shift in this to try to use these devices up front before the patient decompensates so you can prevent them from decompensating and then having to deal with all the other ICU issues that can occur. There are different ways to select patients for left side support because Impella is not the only device. Balloon pump, ECMO, Tandem Heart, and Impella all exist. And I'll share these slides with you later, but there's a variety of ways to parse this out. The bottom line is if you really want good left ventricular unloading, you typically need a percutaneous LVAD type of device. A device like ECMO, which actually loads the left side of the heart, must be combined with some other device, otherwise you increase afterload and potentially increase myocardial uh, oxygen demand. Here's another case just to show you, and this is like the case from this morning that um, Antonio showed, a patient that was randomized in the PROTECT-2 trial, had severe disease of the uh, distal left main extending into the LAD, and I'm not going to go through it in detail other than to say that during the case, flow stopped in the LAD and the circumflex shut down. So this doesn't happen all the time, it's not necessarily predictable, but what happened is the hemodynamics that I really want to show you. And this is similar to what Antonio showed this morning, where on, in the red arrow here you can see the aortic tracing. You maintain a mean arterial pressure with minimal pulsatility of the left ventricle. So the device is basically supporting the patient, the PA pressures have gone up, you see massive ST elevations, but yet the patient is able to be talking, and though the PA pressures go up, she's stable, allowing the rescue to occur, the rescue of the side branch. And so in this particular case, the left main, the LED were stented, and the, uh, the left main remained hazy distally, but it, things were rescued, and the patient ultimately underwent stenting and did very well, and was able to be discharged from the hospital and survived this potentially catastrophic event. I think it's safe to say if you have this event without any support or with a lesser amount of support, these are not straightforward cases. You're doing CPR during the middle of the case and maybe you could salvage it, but chances are it might not happen. So who do we consider support for in our current lab? There are specific categories of patients, patients with either severe LV dysfunction or irreversible adverse hemodynamics, and you want to support them for ischemic stress during the PCI as well as the contrast load. If you have LV dysfunction with uncontrolled interruption of flow in a major branch due to angulation, tortuosity, or otherwise, these are cases in whom we su potentially support. We'll even consider support if there's a CTO and a large donor vessel that we have to go retrograde in, although that's not true in all cases. And then with preserved EF, it would really have to be a very, very nasty lesion requiring atherectomy or something like that. We very rarely use this device for patients that have preserved EFs. Now, in terms of high-risk PCI, how do we consider these types of patients? It's important to assess whether we're going to use it prophylactically or standby and how much support is necessary. And really, what do the difference matter in clinical practice? Because there are clearly cost implications here, and they're beyond cost implications. There are other real complications that can occur with the use of these types of devices. This is just a slide that, um, uh, based on an article we published in JAMA Cardiology not too long ago, looking at the rates of hematomas, transfusions, and repeat vascular interventions for these devices. They're not small, and so we insist in our lab that operators who do this know how to do balloon crossover techniques from the contralateral side to be able to manage the vascular complications that can occur with these types of devices. Um, in sort of conclusion, what I'll end with is basic clinical medicine. What should you do for high-risk PCI or shock? Number one, examine the patient and look at the echo yourself. Don't just meet the patient in the cath lab, look at the anatomy and say, I can treat this. You need to treat the patient, not the angiogram. Do a right heart catheterization. Many people don't value the right heart catheterization. It can be invaluable not only for the diagnosis of these patients, even the management of the patient when they have a support device in. Remember, when you're emptying the left ventricle with a powerful device, you can drop your blood pressure. You don't know if that drop in blood pressure is due to cardiogenic causes or is due to hypovolemia because you've emptied the left ventricle. We manage these patients actively with a Swan-Gans catheter in while we do the procedure so we know to volume load those types of patients versus going up on, on ionotropes or other devices like, or other pressors like that. You want to integrate the ejection fraction, valvular disease, what territories there are at risk, and then the hemodynamics themselves. And then typically speaking, you think about it early and get it up front rather than doing it in a bailout situation. 
Just a final picture on why it's important to look at the echo yourself. This is a patient that we were about to put in a left ventricular support device. We did an echo, saw clot in the, in the ventricle, and then opted for a different approach. So with that, I think I'm going to conclude. Um, it's really been a pleasure to be here tonight. I know that everybody's anxious for dinner. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Ajay, for a wonderful lecture. So. I think we have had a taste of all widely different but very relevant three new topics which were introduced to us this evening. Uh, can I invite Mr. Gurmeet Singh to give a vote of thanks to all these speakers? And let's give a big hand to all these speakers. My sincere thanks to the chairperson for making this session uh, meaningful. Uh, also, thanks for staying here. Uh, CSI had a mandate of not serving alcohol, and uh, I was telling Dr. Shridhar Kasturi and Dr. Shinivas that I'm not sure whether people would stay, but they told that the technologies are compulsive enough, and I think you'll have enough crowd. So thanks, Dr. Shinivas and Dr. Kasturi, for allowing us this session. Uh, Dr. Kirtane would also be here during the dinner, and you can ask the questions. It's unfortunate that uh, the dinner has to start and we don't have time for questions to the uh, technology. Uh, the other thing is that Impela is also placed in a uh, training village at uh, meeting room number five at the Transluminar Training Village. So you can come tomorrow and uh, uh, also play with the device and if you have more questions, we'll be very, very keen to answer them. So on behalf of Transluminar Therapeutics and my team, I want to thank you all for uh, staying here for so late and again thanks to the chairpersons.